Shall we call the meeting to order? So recording all set or shall I wait another minute or so? We're good to go. Good to go. Okay, well, I'll just note this meeting is being conducted in, in con accordance with government code section 549553 in consideration of the coronavirus, all members of the Silicon Valley Energy Executive Committee and staff will participate. This says Executive Committee. If this this committee will <laughs> participate in this meeting by teleconference. Uh, so could I do? Could I have a roll call, please? Yes, Chair Rennie. Here. Vice Chair Mikacek. Present. Gibbons. Here. Klein. Present. Martinez Beltran. Here. Thank you. All are present. We have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, looks like next on the agenda is comments uh, from the public on matters not listed on our agenda. I don't see any hands, so I will close. You do. Actually, you have a hand up, Chair. Um, uh, Director Makachev. Interesting. It's not showing. Oh, oh it's, it's, it's his real hand. Go, go ahead, direct, <laughs> Director Makachev. <laughs> I, I just... I just wanted to welcome Ms. Pisano back after her absence. Thank you. So it's good to see her again. All right, sounds good. Uh, so we'll close the public comment uh, uh, items not on our agenda portion and move on to our consent calendar. We have two items on consent, which are approval of minutes from August 2nd and November 29th. Um, are there any um, changes, questions on that? Seeing none, could I have a motion to approve? Move, move to approve this consent calendar. All right. Second. Uh, second from Director Mekachuk. Let me check the public if they have any comments they'd like to make. I <laughs> cannot see any hands up. Close the public comments on this item and come back. Any, any other comments? Don't see any hands from the committee. Could I have a, a roll call vote, please? Uh, yes, Chair Rennie. Yes. Vice Chair Makachuk. Aye. Gibbons. Yes. Klein. Yes. Martinez Beltran. Aye. Thank you. That motion carries unanimously. Thank you. That's great. We move on from the consent calendar to our regular calendar. Item number two is CEO update, and I will turn it over to the CEO. Thank you, Chair Rennie. The only update I have is. It looks like this is informal information that the PG&E uh, rate change is expected to take effect March 1. Uh, so that's what we hear right now. There have been some meetings between Cal CCA and CPUC staff and PG&E staff, and that's what we are expecting uh, March 1. So we will update you in the new year as we get more official information. Uh, that is the end of my report. Okay, I'll just officially ask if there's any members of the public wish to speak on this item. Not seeing any hands, I'll close public comment. Um, any questions from committee members or comments? Seeing none, we'll close item number two and move to item number three, which is an update on Silicon Valley Clean Energy's investment policy and, con and the consideration of hiring an investment portfolio manager. And I assume I'm turning this over to um, Amrit. Yes, thank, thank you, Chair Rennie. Um, so we have an investment policy that is uh, pretty limited in, in what we can do than what the government code allows us to do. And, current, and a lot of the other CCAs have, uh, have more opportunity to invest in and exercise more of, of what the government code allows them to invest in. So currently, most of our, our portfolio is invested in with one institution, the River City Bank, um, and that has some concerns for us. One, as you know, the interest rates are really no, low, so we're earning a, a low rate of return on an annual basis. It's about 0.15%. So we are exploring opportunities to not only improve on the return that we can get on our investment, but also to reduce the risk by holding a more diversified portfolio. 
So to help with that effort, we hired management partners. Actually, they're helping us in a number of fronts in the budgeting side, as well as internal controls and policies. And one of the areas is also helping us think through our investment strategy. Uh, so Jim Steele from Management Partners is here to present uh, um, a path that we're proposing forward. So at this point, we're not asking committee for any uh, approval or any recommendations to take to the board. We want to make the committee aware of, of what of the, the task that we're engaging in. We want to solicit your comment and feedback that you may have for us, and we will incorporate that in, into the next steps. And, and we'll, we'll come back to the committee um, with the, the um, updates to the investment policy. And, and if the committee, committee agrees with us of hiring PFM asset management as a potential portfolio manager for us, we will be working with them. They will be helping us to update the investment uh, policy as well as recommend an investment strategy. And they will work with the committee and, and will work with us to seek board approval. And again, as stated in the staff report, the payment is all only contingent on them being hired as a portfolio manager for the time that they will spend upfront for us. There is no obligation on our half to pay for that. So that's sort of a background. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jim. Thank you, Amrit. Can you all hear me okay? Uh, my name is Jim Steele. I'm with Management Partners, as Amrit said. Um, our firm was formed in 1994 to provide um, local government services. Uh, we do a variety of things, including financial studies, organization reviews, uh, planning, human resources, and a host of things. I've been with Management Partners for about five years. And before that, I was a local government city finance director for about uh, 15 years. I was in local government for a total of 30 years. So I'm going to, um, hopefully I'll get this right, Andrea, uh, get my presentation up on the screen. There we go. And um, for some reason, it's not letting me share it as a uh, presentation here. Can you all see it? Yeah, it looks OK. OK. So what I want to do is first go over um, uh, what SVCE's current practices are what the California government code uh, says and allows about uh, local government investments, what best practices are for local government, and then walk the committee through the re request for proposal process that we went through with, with uh, SVCE staff and the review process. And then as Amrit said, recommendations, next steps. Currently uh, SVCE has a, a cash portfolio of about $160 million. Funds are held exclusively by River City Bank, that's SVCE's local bank, and the earnings rate, the last uh, uh, report I saw was approximately 0.15%. Interest rates are low across the board, uh, but that's currently what the earnings rate is at River City Bank. The California Government Code uh, specifies what investments are allowed for local governments, and they're, they're relatively narrow. For example, the most um, uh, striking uh, restriction is local governments cannot invest in stocks, equities, or stock mutual funds. And the goal of, of the restrictions is to make sure that local governments invest prudently and preserve their principal while earning a modest return, but, but a prudent return. Safety, liquidity, and yield are the goals in, in, in that order. And primarily, uh, local governments in, invest in US treasuries, US agencies, and qualified uh, local government investment pools, short-term bonds that are highly rated, and several other vehicles. Best practices is that firms diversify their portfolio holdings, not keep them all uh, in, in one place. 
just as your own personal uh, savings or investments, you probably have them in a variety of places rather than all in one place. That securities are held by a third party bank in trust. So for example, um, if, if I have my own personal portfolio with Fidelity Investments, they have my, my securities under my name with them uh, and they aren't, my funds aren't intertwined with any of Fidelity's funds. So they're held in trust and that's best practice. So the, the idea would be that whatever um, SVCE ends up doing, that it holds investments with a third party bank. Uh, examples of that are Wells Fargo, um, I believe Union Bank, uh, Bank of New York are firms that do that, not the bank that you have your operating funds with. Other best practices are to develop an investment portfolio that uh, investment policy that fits your risk profile and that seeks uh, prudent investments according to that risk profile while keeping sufficient liquid funds for day-to-day -day monthly needs and for emergencies. And by doing so, uh, there'd be a higher rate of return than just leaving funds in the bank. Yield is the third goal, safety liquidity yield. Having said that, um, the current earnings 0.15% are what SDCE earns with uh, River City Bank. Uh, LAIF right now, that's local government investment fund. It's a highly liquid government investment pool, totally separate from the state budget that's run on behalf of local governments. It also is low, 0.12%. Uh, insured cash sweeps is another investment vehicle that your staff has looked at that they can, they can uh, get through River City Bank. That would be higher, currently at 0.26%. And um, PFM, the firm that was uh, successfully responded to the RFP and which, which staff was impressed with, most recently earned 0.4% on a portfolio that they managed for Peninsula Clean Energy. So you can see hypothetically um, a 0.4% earnings rate on a portfolio size of about 110 million and I'm just uh, throwing that out there. That would be determined after you go through your risk profile and your cash flow needs. But you would want to hold funds in liquid uh, investment pools, for example, for day-to-day -day use. So assuming 110 million, potentially you could be earning $440,000 a year under uh, PFM's um, uh, investment policy. And, and guidance. And that's higher than even uh, in, insured cash sweep or the current bank. So uh, uh, quite, quite a difference there. The other advantage of professional portfolio management is ongoing monitoring of the portfolio, uh, making sure the duration, you know, the, the length of investments match uh, what's appropriate and prudent for your risk profile, reviewing the credit, reviewing the brokers that are bidding on the investments uh, to, when, they're, when bids are getting made, making sure those brokers uh, meet due diligence standards. And so the services of an outside portfolio management are cost effective because those are steps that while your own staff can do, they take time and expertise that are probably better done um, dealing with your own uh, energy portfolio and, and other things. So um, management partners assisted SDEC, SDCE staff in drafting a request for proposals. It was crafted consistent with guidelines that the California Society of Municipal Finance Officers has put out for similar RFPs. And it was sent to uh, agencies, uh, to firms that were recommended by CSMFO agencies. We received responses from two highly qualified firms with widespread use among California local governments. That was PFM Asset Management and Chandler Asset Management. 
And I should add, there aren't a lot of firms that specialize in local government investments for California. And that's important. It's important to get a firm that has expertise and experience in that area because the investment policy for local governments is much narrower than it would be for a private firm. So those are pretty much the two firms that operate in California and by all um, measures, they're, they're highly qualified. So for example, PFM Asset Management, that was the firm that, that staff thought was superior, um, has been providing similar services for 41 years. It manages almost $25 billion on behalf of public agencies, including $4 billion for special districts. So SDCE would, be, would qualify as a special district. Uh, it would provide fiduciary oversight of F FECE's funds. In other words, it, it'll be legally required to act in SDCE's best interest. It would not uh, earn any outside comp compensation or commission from any of the investments it makes, and it would competitively bid out any securities that it, that it buys on behalf of SDCE. So in other words, it doesn't carry any of its own investment inventory. It doesn't earn any money that way. It's purely acting in the client's best interest as a fiduciary. Uh, there aren't any uh, SEC censures or disciplinary actions that, that are currently or have been for PFM. Um, it provides a online portal for SVE staff to log in and see at any time what the holdings are. PFM would comply with um, global investment performance standards. And those are uh, international standards that, that speak to the proper way to measure uh, portfolio duration, to measure performance and standards for benchmarking so that you know if you're uh, receiving results from PFM, they're gonna be consistent with how uh, another firm that also complies with GIPS uh, would, be, would be reporting on those same investments. It can provide customized investment reports upon request. Those would be reports that would be uh, forwarded on to the committee and the board if you choose to go ahead with their services. And they would not hold any funds on behalf of SECE. They would all be held, as I mentioned earlier, by a third party bank acting as a, a, a trustee or a custodian on behalf of SECE. And that's very, very important for internal control purposes. Both firms, Chandler and PFM were, were qualified. Uh, PFM did rate higher from the committee, um, the review committee. Their proposal seemed stronger. Their firm was larger and had more uh, backup staff, so to speak. Uh, and that speaks to their personnel as well. Uh, staff was very impressed with their approach and, and how they communicated and felt that they would be a very, very good match in the times that, that uh, communications to the board would be needed and, and reporting to the board because the interactions and the comfort level of the board is going to be a really important part of any engagement if you choose to go forward. And last, we did, uh, I did check references and they were all uh, very highly rated for PFM. So uh, I think Amrit mentioned there's not a formal recommendation staff's making today. What they're, I, I, uh, I think they're just seeking concurrence that they plan on entering into contract discussions with PFM as a next step. And the, and the first step of that would be to work with uh, Amrit and his staff to develop an updated investment policy that takes into account an appropriate risk profile for, for SDCE. Then that would be brought back to the Finance and Administration Committee and ultimately the full board for feedback uh, and tweaking if need be, and then finally approval. Once that revised investment policy is approved, the recommendation likely then would be to retain PFM as the portfolio manager and to, for PFM to implement that investment policy consistent with the risk profile and any cash flow needs 
that you've identified. So they would not be, um, I'm, I'm jumping ahead, but they would not be investing every last dollar that SVCE holds. I mentioned earlier that perhaps out of 160 million, maybe 110 million would be a prudent investment. But that, that remains to be seen. Those would be part of the risk discussions. Fees are based only on the amount of funds that PFM invests. They don't get any uh, additional fees based on transactions. They don't hold SVCE's funds. And they would only be due if at a later date, the board uh, authorizes staff to go ahead and utilize them as their portfolio manager. Assuming that $110 million was the annual amount invested on behalf of SVCE, the annual fee would be $86,000. And that sounds like a lot, but if you go back to the uh, potential extra earnings, um, $440,000 rather than $165,000 today, those would be more than, than uh, compensated for. And more, perhaps more important than that, you'd be getting several additional benefits. Your portfolio would be professionally managed. It would be monitored regularly. It would be diversified, so it would be much less volatile. And I think you could, as, as board members, could sleep easier at night knowing that your funds are being watched closely by professional um, uh, portfolio managers. So that completes this part of the discussion and happy to answer any questions. I see a question from Director Gibbons, go ahead. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Steele, appreciate uh, your information. Could we go back to your second to last slide there? Um, yes, let me pull that back up. My apologies. That's okay. Uh, it's the one that does the, uh, the dollars. Uh, yes. There was a little math question I had. It, uh, the 0.15 was uh, returning more than the point one, uh, less than the 0.12. So I wanted to understand why that was that difference. And then the second question was the 440,000 on the bottom line um, for um, PFM. Um, is that gross number less than 86 or is that a net number? Great. I can you hear me? I, did I take myself off mute? Yeah, yeah we can still hear you. And you can see the screen that you're talking about, correct? Yeah, yeah. So, yes, thank you. Yeah, let me walk through that a little clearer. Um, assuming you had $110 million in, in a portfolio, and assuming that $110 million was all left in it, uh, uh, your current bank, the bank would earn on your behalf $165,000. If that was all moved to the state investment pool, it would be, oh, you're right, you're right. That should have been 0.22, it's 231,000, 0.22. So Leif earns a little more than uh, uh, the current bank. My apologies. That's okay, I just- just Yeah, good cash. Back in my brain. And then um, the bottom number, the 440, um, is that gross or net of the 86,000 fee? That's gross. So it'd be 440,000 minus 86,000 is what, 350 something thousand, still higher than any of the other options with, and again, I think this is important to stress, uh, you'd be getting professional oversight, regular monitoring, credit reviews, in a much more diversified portfolio. Yeah. Does, um, does I, that I answer think, your question? Yeah, I, the, the professionalism issue is, is clearly a side versus what we're doing, but I do think it would be helpful to have one more column that's annualized gross and annualized net. Yes. Thank you. And I, I had a question, um, I'm not finding the answer. Um, it's in your presentation, you uh, mentioned uh, there was a team or, or some group of people that did the evaluation and chose uh, between the two, but I don't think I saw anywhere who, who was that, who was on the team? I believe that might've been in the report uh, and I didn't put it in the PowerPoint, but it was Amrit and, and Kevin from your staff it was Andy Stern, who's the CFO of Peninsula Clean Energy, 
who went through a, an RFP process and ended up selecting PFM, I wanna say a year or so ago. That wasn't how the selection was made for PFM, but we figured someone who'd been through that process would be helpful. I was also on the panel. I went through an RFP process, um, I wanna say 15 years ago, similar to this one with other city finance directors at the time serving on the panel to select uh, the firm we selected. Okay, thank you. I don't see any more hands from our, okay, go ahead, um, Director Mekachuk. Um, are you gonna open up the public portion right now and then close it and then bring it back to us? Um, I was going to do that, yes. There yeah. are two, okay. two um, alternate board members on uh, as the public. I wanted to check to see if they had any questions or comments and I'm not seeing any hands from them. If Sergio or Hungway is interested, raise your hand. I don't see it at this point. So I'll close the public testimony and come back to us. Uh, go ahead, Director Mekachuk. So and let me see if I understand this correctly and, and perhaps Mr. Steele, you could just put up one of the slides does, doesn't matter which one. Actually, the one that uh, you were showing to Director Gibbons would be perfect. The second one from the end. Okay, so I see your logo in the bottom left and Silicon Valley Clean Energy's logo in the bottom right. This Silicon Valley Clean Energy engaged you to do this work is that correct to put this report together my firm is working on several uh financial excuse me several financial um reviews and studies right now on behalf of svce this is one of those got, we, got it we, okay yeah. and then what you're doing is going through kind of a case study here as what you did for uh, another client. Is that correct? Um, what I'm, I'm not sure I understand. I'm what, what's presented to you is the process we management partners went through in uh, drafting an RFP, sending that RFP out, reviewing the, the proposals and having those firms interviewed by the, the, the people that I mentioned. Right, I, I'm sorry, in, in my vernacular, I would say you were described, you, it was a case study of what you did for another one of your clients. That's, that's neither here nor there, I, I get it. I'm, I'm just trying to put this into context. Um, in, the, uh, in the second row there, the LAFE earnings is, and that, and, Director Given, Givens, you were super sharp to get that 0.12 versus the, the math yes. doesn't work. So yep. well done. Um, is there a duration that's different in the portfolios that yield these earnings? There is. And I don't have those numbers readily available. The duration is one of the discussions that your staff would have with, uh, if, if you go forward with PFM, as far as what's appropriate. So looking at cash flow needs, how much is going to be invested, what's an appropriate duration given the current uh, interest rate environment, and what's potentially the interest rate environment coming up. I understood. I I, I'm, I'm pressed for time, so forgive me if I'm trying to go too fast. I, I get duration. I understand yep. I'm a, got lots of finance. Um, and I, I'm, I'm just trying to wonder, I, I'm, my question is, how short term are the securities? So, okay. Um... It, like when you're talking about a portfolio of securities, I get it that you want yeah. to have a, a diversified, some people may want a diversified portfolio, but in that case, you'll never beat the market. 
if you have a concentrated portfolio, you can blow the market away. I get that, but you've got different risk. But I'm just wondering how short term the portfolios are. And if they are short term, you know, how much value there is in a quote diversified portfolio. And uh, the, the LAFE portfolio, is that, is that fully managed? And, and so, so, and it's all meets all the requirements of the California government, et cetera. So we could put our money with them and just go to sleep because Absolutely. they're managing the duration, they're managing everything. Absolutely. Um, there's a restriction of uh, uh, 75 million per agency with LAFE. They don't invest specifically for each client. It would be part of a pool. Yeah. And, uh, but all their investments are compliant with the government code. I want to say their duration, and I'm going off a report I reviewed, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago, is around six months. So that's why their, their earnings are higher than what you can get from your bank. But a portfolio that would be managed uh, actively on your behalf would have um, investments going out further. There'd probably be staggered investments. And, and that would be one reason why you'd be earning more. Yeah, we'd have them laddered out. Exactly. Insurers, yep. And you go that far out and yes. you just keep rolling it and away you go. Yep. Um, okay, I I understand. Uh, I think those are the all of my questions. Thank you. If I could just follow up on that, so the, if, with them laddered, that doesn't prevent us from accessing all of the cash if we need it for some reason. If let's say we had a bad year, um, they would just end up selling the treasuries before they mature. Correct. Yes, and um, as, I, as I tried to indicate, most likely you would, not most likely, you would retain some funds in something like LAFE in an investment pool that was immediately available. So you didn't have to risk selling something potentially at a, at a slight loss. So the, the benefit of an investment pool is you're always getting um, uh, a dollar back for the principal you put in. And that's one, one uh, reason why the, the earnings rate is so low is because they're keeping the duration very short. So just to summarize, LAIF would allow you to uh, uh, take money out on any given day. And um, you would most likely leave funds in something like LAIF, um, maybe 30, 40, 50 million. And that's just, I'm just throwing that number out there. Okay, thank you. Let me go to um, Director Martinez Beltran. Thank you, Chair Rennie. Um, Good afternoon. Thank you for your presentation. I just really, you know, continuing along that line, uh, I'm new to this committee and new to understanding how we work. But what I do understand is that energy companies, you know, in securing our energy, there are major shifts that, that can happen. And so I just want to, I guess, reassure that we, that PFM, I know has a large list of, of clients because I'm very familiar with PFM. Um, but do, are they familiar with working with, you talked about public agencies and special districts, how comfortable are they working with energy companies that have swings like this? Thank you for that question. And yes, um, I mentioned that they are working with Peninsula Clean Energy. One of the key things that would happen if, if you guys, if SVCE moves forward, is a discussion of what's the potential dollar amount that in any given month, there could be a swing and you'd need cash. That's absolutely essential to the risk profile that I, that I mentioned. And right. that would be something that your staff would make sure they were watching out and leaving sufficient funds liquid for any eventuality like that. And, and I, I also want to reiterate that that investment policy and probably the investment plan itself would come back to the committee for review. So you'd see specific recommendations at that point before moving forward with anything. 
Okay, looks like um, Director Alexandra wants to add to that answer. Yeah, yes. I think that, so sure. it would be, I'd like to see if we could, if we could include that in the presentation, I think to the general board, that would be really important to include. Um, I'd also, I, I know somebody mentioned that I think it would be important, you know, to know who are some of the other energy companies that they use. Do we, I know you talked about Peninsula Energy, um, you know, maybe you can share a couple more there. So if I may just add to Jim's answer, Director Martinez Beltran, uh, public financial management has worked with utilities, especially public sector utilities across the country for many, many years. So they are Great. quite active in the municipal utility space. They also worked with us as we went through our ratings with Standard and Poor's and Moody's. So they are very familiar with the rating agencies and what rating agencies also look for. Uh, I get your question also and your comment is to make sure that their experience with energy companies is also highlighted in addition to cities. Right. Okay, well, great. That's that's very helpful. Thank you. Um, I, I have many colleagues from uh, Wagner NYU that are at PFM. <laughs> Thank you. And just to add to what um, Mr. Balachandran just, just mentioned, uh, Peninsula Clean Energy we mentioned, there are municipal utility districts that PFM manages. For, for example, Modesto Irrigation District, they actually also run an electric utility. City of Santa Clara has an electric utility and PFM manages the City of Santa Clara's portfolio. It's not quite the same as the CCA, but they are very familiar with the cash flow needs of, of a, a CCA. Thank you, Director Gibbons. Yes, I'm sorry to, uh, I need to clarify something of Mr. Uh, Director Mechachuk's question. The case study that he was referring to isn't really for someone else. This is the work that was done on behalf of Silicon Valley Clean Energy. Absolutely. It was done, it was done for us. Yes. It is not information from anywhere else. Correct. Okay, I just want to make sure Director Mekocek gets that clarified. So uh, it's not clear. Did you do an RFP? Yes. On behalf of Silicon Valley Clean Energy. Yes, and and the, ah, and the report, okay. that, the report you, that we generated gives a link to where that RFP that. is. You can actually review that at your leisure. Got it. Okay. And I apologize, I didn't realize that was your question. Yeah. Um, so in, in trying to wrap this up, do you need a motion um, on this item? It, it says discussion, but then you also are saying you want concurrence to engage um, in contract discussions. Um, do we need a, a motion or? No, not for this item. This is to bring it to your awareness, incorporate your feedback and is, is this, you know, that this is a path we're pursuing and there'll be future engagement with the committee and the board as, as we engage with PFM and get ready to update our investment policy, what the recommended investment strategy is, what the liquidity cash flow needs are, all of that will be coming back to the committee. So we just wanna make you aware that we're engaging in this effort and we will be coming back to the committee in the okay. next, uh, I, I haven't seen, uh, I haven't heard any, any concerns. Is, does, is there any concerns from anybody to continue to move ahead along, moving ahead along this path? Go ahead, I don't Brian. have any concerns, but I'd, I'd like to uh, ask uh, Amrit some questions offline just for my own ed edification, but, but I, I think we're good. And uh, I was going to say, when you talk about liquidity requirements, uh, I was going to say, Amrit, isn't that what your crystal ball is for? <laughs> <laughs> yes. If you remember the last meeting, we talked about the stress test and how cash flows can, in the energy market has been volatile. So we'll have to look at a lot of things, you know, the volatility of the energy market, um, you know, our credit uh, uh, margin collateral requirements we have with counterparties, all of that will go into a detailed analysis. And then we'll say, okay, this is what we feel comfortable investing 
and uh, along with looking at our crystal ball as to what the future revenue is for us, depending on what the PUC does. Um, Director Klein. Yes, I, I didn't have any concerns. Uh, one thing I did want to, you know, bring up as we're going into these contracts and negotiations, uh, being very clear about kind of the exit strategy. If at some point we do find that that there might be a better alternative out there, or you know, for whatever reason, uh, the representation just does not mesh, and and I understand that that this process was to clarify, you know, the top contender the top two contenders at this at this point but you know often when we're talking about large sums of money uh, that exit strategy isn't always as easy as we might think so i just want to make sure that that's that's my only concern to make sure that at, that's part of the discussions as we move forward and and just to just to add to that the, the funds no matter what you decide to do will always be in your direct control, they would be in your name in a bank that you select. Um, and I think the provision you're maybe suggesting is in the contract itself, making sure there's provisions for canceling if for if if, if the agency isn't satisfied with their performance. Absolutely, thank you. All right, thank you. Um, let me wrap up this um, item and move on to uh, I think it's item number four, which is a review of our. Pre, uh, the prepay transaction. Um, and we have a um, director Mekacek and I need to leave in about four minutes. I don't know if you can do it. Um, maybe I should ask, see if, if director Mekacek has any questions before we do a presentation since you most likely read it. Yeah, I, um, I'm gonna have to leave almost right now. So, um, but I think that uh, the, I think we're in good hands with respect to the prepay, but I, I'll watch the presentation afterwards. All right, okay? sounds good. Um, so I may have to leave before the end of the presentation. So I guess if I can just delegate the meeting to um, the vice chair of our board to, to run after that, um, Director Gibbons, if that's okay with you. So I'll, I'll turn it over to, to um, I guess, Amrit again to give the presentation. Uh, go ahead, Director. Yeah. Mike. And if, if uh, Chair Rennie, if you and I leave, will there still be a quorum or what happens? Or do we need a quorum to, for information? Anyways. We don't, we, don't, we don't really need a quorum. Andrea okay. says we do have a quorum. Um, we do have a quorum. Yeah. OK, so I'm going to leave and say goodbye. Thanks, Bye. everyone. OK, so this is just a brief recap, so it's not going to take too much time. Uh, so there's no new information, but I just want to take an opportunity to come back to the committee and, and talk about uh, the transaction we completed. We spent a lot of time and effort on this on this project, so I just want to do a brief recap. So we'll go to the next slide, Andrea, please. Uh, so we'll review the timeline, as, as you'll see from the timeline, as an agency, we've spent uh, over two years working on this transaction. So it's, it's, I'm very pleased to see it to completion, successful completion. We'll briefly review what our goals were uh, in engaging with this transaction, what the board authorized execution parameters were, and then we'll briefly review the terms of the executed transaction, and we'll, we'll also do what the cost of, of, of engaging in this transaction was and what the future next steps are. Okay, so that's, that's the agenda and we'll go with the next slide now. So timeline, we, as I said, we as an organization, we've spent over two years, so well before my time. Uh, we've been working on this for, starting in June of 2019. And during that time, we've made several presentations to the Finance Committee, Executive Committee, and to the board. And if you remember, in April of 2021, we joined California Committee Choice Financing Authority, where we are one of the founding members, along with uh, three other CCAs, uh, East Bay Community Energy, uh, uh, Central Coast Community Energy, and Marine Clean Energy. 
Uh, and that's the entity that is, uh, is the entity that actually issues the bond, we call it the bond conduit. And in August of 2021, after we had completed all the terms of, the, of, uh, of structuring the prepay in the, in the commercial transact and negotiations, we sought committee's recommendation to, uh, to recommend that the board approve the, the prepay transaction. And then in the August meeting, the board gave us authority to, to enter into the 30 year prepay transaction. And that transaction after the board approval uh, was successfully, the bonds were successfully priced on September 9th and the transactions was officially closed on September 23. So that's a brief timeline and we'll go to the next slide. So quick review of what we wanted out of our prepay transaction. We wanted to reduce the cost of our power purchases by basically leveraging our ability to have access to, to low cost tax exempt debt. Uh, again, uh, so what we're doing here is basically because as a public entity, we or our com conduit CCCFA has access to tax exempt debt, which is lower than corporate debt. And then we basically look at the difference between the corporate debt that Morgan Stanley would otherwise get versus the tax exempt debt. And we translate that savings, say, give us, the, because we are essentially giving you access to low cost of capital, you flow that savings back to us in a form of a power, a discount to our power purchases that we flow through the prepay transaction. And what we, and I'll just emphasize that this is a competitive advantage that we have of our IOUs because they are a taxable entity. So that's, that's good to have any kind of competitive advantage in a commodity business. Our target benefits over the 30 year term was to get about eight to 12% on our savings and our power purchases that we run through the prepay structure. We were estimating that this would translate to about 1.3 to 1.7 million a year. We wanted the, uh, we didn't want to take on any, essentially any additional risk. So the, for the most part, that's what we did. Uh, the, the debt that we issued is non-recourse. So it's not secured by us or any of our assets. Uh, it's solely um, uh, secured by the proceeds of the transactions, the proceeds that CCCFA gets. And for the large part, the bonds are backed by Morgan Stanley. So if any issue with the bond the investors have, they will they will go uh, for the most part to Morgan Stanley. Okay, we'll go to the next slide. So when we sought a board's approval, the board gave us authority to not exceed 1.25 billion in bond proceeds, the par value, the principal amount of the bonds. The board also said that, uh, you know, we were to get at least a $3 a megawatt hour savings for the initial term of the bonds. And the bonds would not be our obligations, which they are not. So in the next slide, let's review the terms of the executed transactions. So the, the principal amount of bonds that was executed was about $1.2 3 billion, close to the 1.25 billion board, board authorized limit. And again, this is the amount between us and East Bay Community Energy. Our share is essentially about 46% of this. The bond proceeds, the actual cash that we received because the bonds traded above the par value were close to 1.5 billion. And the bonds were certified as green bonds because these are clean energy bonds. Uh, by a third party verifier, and that garnered more investor interest in our bonds because, uh, because we were, these are green bonds. The initial term of the bonds is for 10 years. So, what happens after the 10 years is the bonds will be repriced, and, and the pricing, of course, will depend on what the market, uh, what the market conditions are at the time of the repricing and what. What the spread is between the municipal debt and corporate debt at that point. And but we do have a, a minimum threshold that we put in the in the uh, repricing agreement that we 
we are targeting at, at a minimum to get at least two dollars. If we don't get the two dollars, we don't have to go forward uh, with the repricing agreement. The bonds maturity is is a thirty year bond, so it will mature in February first of twenty fifty two. The discount that we got higher than than the board authorized three dollar minimum, we got four dollars and thirty eight cents a megawatt hour, which is about 10% of the cost of energy that we initially assigned into the, into the three year, into the prepay. The, the term of the initial contract is, is, is three year. And after the three year ends, so six months before that, we will assign another contract into the prepay structure, either in an existing power purchase agreement or any new power purchase agreement we enter into. The $4.38 for the first 10 years translates about 1.9 million for, for us, for our share. And our, the, the volume that the, the bond proceeds supported was about 109 megawatts, of which we got 50 megawatts, which is about 11% of our load. And, and the rest went to EBCE for 59 megawatts. The, the delivery and the power prepay will begin on January 1st. So the power del uh, delivery and the savings will, will start realizing starting January 1st uh, of, of the upcoming year. And we'll continue on the next slide. Uh, so very briefly about the cost of the issuance. Again, all, all, all of these were paid from the initial bond proceeds. So it's not like we, again, this is between us, this is total, uh, cost of issuance, so both for us and East Bay Community Energy, our share again would be about 46% of this. And all of this were paid for the bond proceeds, so we do not pay anything upfront, and the savings are net of these costs, so the $4.38 that I, I mentioned. So the we had, as we mentioned before in, in previous presentations, we had a lot of uh, expert professionals that were helping us structure these transactions at bond and tax councils. Um, we got credit rating from Moody's um, and, and, and we had our municipal advisor, which was public financial management. Uh, we had some engagement already with PFM, the investment advisor, PFM public asset management. Um, they issued the investment agreement, uh, which gives us a little bit more additional savings that's baked into the 438. That's basically the flow of funds between when we have to pay um, principal on the bonds versus the timing that we the CCCFA accrues before we pay, we can invest that those dollars and, and earn a little bit of money. And then our trustee, the trustee in this case was Bank of New York. Um, so all of those costs amounted to about 1.4 billion. And then the big cost, of course, is the underwriting that Morgan Stanley took underwriting the bonds, and that was about 6.3 million. So all, all in all, about 7. Point, uh, about 7.8 million in cost. And we'll go to the next slide, Andrea. So next steps are uh, there are some compliance obligations for, from, for tax reasons that CCCFA will have on our behalf. So we will have to hire a arbitrage rebate agent and we're in the process of issuing an RFP through CCCFA to hire a, a arbitrage rebate agent. And this is a basically a filing that we have to make to IRS to show that um, any, I talked about the investment agreement, uh, the return that we get on the investment agreement uh, versus the, the cost of the, of the municipal debt the spread there, the IRS will claim it's, it's very tiny difference. IRS says that's their money. So we will have to do that compliance filing uh, or CCCFA on our behalf will have to do that compliance filing. And there are other ongoing CCCFA uh, disclosure requirements that are to the investors for the SEC rules uh, that we'll be working with CCCFA on. And as I mentioned, once our initial term of the three-year assigned contract ends, we will be assigning a new PP power purchase agreement into the prepay structure. 
So that's a brief highlight of the of the transactions we spent a lot of time and effort on. Uh, and uh, I'm pleased with the outcome and the savings that we've realized on this. And we will be considering in the future other prepay opportunities to bring in additional savings into our, our procurement portfolio. With that, any questions? Thank you, Amrit. Uh, lots and lots and lots of work behind those slides. Thank you. Um, Director uh, Martinez Beltran. Thank you, Chair Gibbons. Um, thank you, Amit. That was such a clear presentation uh, for it being so convoluted and complex for someone outside of your specialty. Uh, I would like to ask you about the repricing. So I don't quite understand, you know, if it's a 30 year bond and at 10 years we're able to reprice it, then what does that mean? If you talked about, if we don't want to reprice it, we don't have to, what then happens? Yeah, so you can think of it as like your, your mortgage. You have a 30 year mortgage mm -hmm. and then you can refinance that, that mortgage, right? To get a different rate. So for okay. us, we have a mandatory uh, date that's 10 years out, a mandatory uh, bond um, offer. So it mm -hmm. has to be repriced in 10 years. And so the bonds will stay in place for 30 years, but the, the, they will be repriced similar to how our, our mortgage refinancing uh, takes place. So we will at that point look at the market and we'll look at what the spread is between the, the tax exempt debt and the corporate debt. That will then dictate the savings. It will it could be higher than 4.38 that we're getting or mm -hmm. lower. But we're saying that if we don't get $2, we have the right to say, I don't want to take Re this, this offer uh, okay. and walk away from it. And at which point Morgan Stanley could either redeem the bonds or most likely what they will do is find another municipal entity that can take mm -hmm. on the obligations and they will flow the savings to them. The likelihood of us working away is pretty small because any savings is better than no savings. Mm -hmm. But we okay. wanted to put some minimum threshold there. So we don't have to do it if it's less than two, but if it we is, don't have to, yeah. if it's above two, then we would be required to do that. Yes, Repart we won't be able, able to walk away from it at that point. So that option uh, exists okay. for us. But if but even if it's a dollar and we say we still want the dollar, we still have the, we can still get that. Okay, well, thank you. Um, I would say it's crystal clear, but I will say instead, I have a uh, good understanding of everything now that you've explained that piece. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm looking for other questions. I see no hands raised. I will go to our participants for public comment. I see no hands raised by our public members. And I will close the public hearing and bring it back to the Finance Committee. Uh, this is also a discussion item. So please feel free to have some discussions. Any thoughts? I think Director Beltran explained um, thoughts quite well just a moment ago. Yes, Director Beltran, uh, Martinez Beltran. Um, do we want, do we need an action to move ahead with approval on the prepaid transfer? No, no, we do not. Okay. Okay. Well, seeing no other raised hands or no one wishing to comment further. Thank you, Amrit and staff, um, everyone. Job well done, and it's no small accomplishment, so well done. And with that, we will move on to committee and staff remarks. Is there anyone on the committee who has any comments to bring to the group? Seeing none. Uh, if there's no objection, uh, yes, um, CEO Balashandra. Just to Quick, uh, first of all, uh, Happy New Year, Merry Christmas. But also when we come back in January, um, we'll have elections in January and then the Finance Committee elections will take place in February. So. 
Thank you for making us aware of that once again, because it comes upon us very quickly. So thank you. And if you're interested um, or have other um, board members who would be interested in the various committees, as well as this one and roles, please encourage people to submit. All right, with that, I thank you all. Wish you a Merry Christmas, uh, Happy New Year, and all that wonderful stuff. <laughs> here's, to, here's to 2022. Merry Bye, Christmas, everyone. Happy New Year, Happy Holidays. Happy Holidays, everyone. Bye. Bye.